this is relevant for you. I'm not going to go into heavy details on each procedure, more just like tips and tricks that you need to know and might make your time and keep a little bit more efficient. Um, so, so the things we're going to do today is kind of approach to the pediatric patient. We're going to talk about pain control procedures. Um, we're going to briefly go over some laceration repair, foreign body removal, as well as your space elbow and urine cap. These are some pretty high yield procedures that you'll see in PS. So when you approach the pediatric patient, I know you guys have probably experienced this, it's not as easy as going into an adult room and just getting history and moving along with the procedure. You kind of have to cater to the parent, you have to cater to the child. Um, a lot of this comes from just anxiety uh, on both the parent and the child's part. Uh, no one likes to be in the hospital, there's like an inherent fear, right? So we kind of have to work with that. Um, having a gentle approach to kids is always going to be helpful. As much as we're usually in a rush in the ER, this is the time when you have those younger kids to really take your time, be extra um, cautious with what you say and how you say it. Um, and then try to use more like age appropriate language. This is when, instead of walking in and being like, I'm going to repair your laceration, this is the time to kind of use those kid terms a little, you know, you have a boo boo, you have an owie, like, you know, just to kind of get everybody on the same page. I, mean, I know it's, you can giggle, that's fine. Um, but <laughs> this is going to be the time to kind of bring yourself back and understand that they don't really know what you're talking about. And when you use these foreign terms, it can make the anxiety and the fear a little bit more uh, intense. So this is the time to get a little playful, okay? And really being prepared is really key. So before you even go in the room, knowing kind of how you're going to talk to the parent and the child, what you're going to say, and kind of knowing how to basically describe the procedure using simple terms so that we don't increase that anxiety. Um, I'll give you some little pointers in terms of what I use in terms of words when I'm explaining procedures. Um, but first off, pain control. So these kids come in with pain, we need to address it because that's going to help us make our procedure go more smoothly. So you'll notice anytime I'm in the ER, if I even see someone with a cut or anything pop up on the board, I'm like out in the triage room, I'm like, where's the lead? Put the lead on. So kind of having that in the back of your mind because it's going to buy you time, right? If you get that on, we all know lead works great within about 40 minutes. So get it on so that you can kind of have them chill out, get that pain control working, and then uh, you know go in and do your procedure within an hour or so. Um, lead's really great. It's a combination of lead cane, epinephrine, and tetracaine. You'll see this. We use this on a lot of forehead wounds. I, I think it's really helpful on any open wound. It's going to take that initial bit of pain away. And if you do need to inject lead cane as well, then it's going to give you a good avenue to do that. Um, the other options, though, which I think sometimes can get a little overlooked, is um, LMX, which is actually a 4% lidocaine. This has more of like a liposomal delivery. You can use it on intact skin. I've used it really um, successfully on abscesses, actually, if they're like maybe a little open, but mostly closed. Um, a good blob of the LMX on it is really helpful, as well as like foreign bodies, because you really just want to get in there and get a good exam. If you can numb the area, and actually sometimes it'll soften the tissue a little, that can make it a little easier to proceed. So LMX is definitely a good option. Emla is probably something we've heard of a little more often. This is the white one that um, we tend to use for IV starts. So if, if you know someone's a hard stick or they're getting IVs placed a lot, this is just a good like off the top of your head being able to say to the nurse, hey, like why don't we put some Emla on, give it a couple minutes to work before doing our IV. But you can also use this on an abscess as well. Uh, one thing I've started using a little more frequently is actually viscous lidocaine. I've had really good luck with um, lip lax and like little tongue lax that if you put like a little blob of this on a cotton swab and just have the mom hold it on the lac, it doesn't take long to work and it's actually worked really well. I've had four year olds just sit there while I sew them up and they've been really comfortable. So just kind of having all these different in, uh, options in your bag of tricks can really help uh, make the situation go a little easier. Um, Motrin and Tylenol also is something not to be overlooked, right? If you have a cut, it's going to hurt. It's one thing if we take the surface pain away, but kind of getting something on board systemically can help. Especially these kids with like forehead lax. They just bang their head. They may have something equivalent to a headache. You know, don't hesitate to give them something. It's easy, it's quick, it's cheap, it makes everybody happy. Um, lidocaine, I, I don't have to use this too much if I use let and use it appropriately. Um, but when you do use it, you need to know, am I using epi or not epi, right? It's going to give you a little bit of hemostasis, which is nice, but you need to be careful with what location you're putting it in. So we don't really want epinephrine 
um, too much when it comes to like the distal uh, fingertips, anything near the penis, or um, ears, right? So just based on their blood supply. Um, one thing that we don't use a lot here, but I've used it a lot at uh, well, here as in county, um, but downstate actually, ethyl chloride spray is really great. We do have this at Kings County. You just have to ask the nurse. It's in the back room. Um, it's actually really, really, really cold and you just kind of shoot it right on the area that you're going to incise or drain. I use this on paranychias on the finger and it works fantastic. So this is kind of quick. They almost get distracted by the spray of it. It's really icy cold and then you kind of just go in. You know, make sure you clean first, but then you just go in and kind of pop whatever you need to drain and it works really great. So something else you may want to try using the next chance. So how long is the timeline for that? Like how, how long do you have after the spray? To Very quickly. Like you literally have to be like, you maybe you get someone else to help you, but spray it pretty, you know, you're going to give it like a good 15, 20, 30 second spray, and then you're going to go in and do it. It doesn't last very long. It's that cold. It's left for a minute, right? Like yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's why you got to have everything ready. But it works really nice, and, and I've had a fair level of it. Um, Again, for your bigger stuff, you can do a nerve block work. You guys are probably very familiar with doing that. Um, this is great for like, you know, extensive hand wax or any time you have like a foreign body that's kind of deep and you're going to have to dig. Um, and then also remembering sedation, right? Sometimes we have to sedate these kids. We're doing a lot more intranasal, so don't be afraid to try that. It's not invasive in terms of there's no IV placement. Um, you know, when we explain this to parents, that we can get into this a little more when we talk in our CBL about intranasal stuff, but um, a lot of them are, are pretty apt to try something. It's a spray, a medication in your nose, and we're not sticking your kid. So keep these in mind. So this is our classic, right? And Sarah talked about this too, so I'm gonna kind of move uh, kind of quickly through all this. But you know, you have your, your classic like one and a half, two year old, active, playful, running at the park, falls in the sandbox. Mom didn't really see exactly where he landed, but she says he just fell and got up. There wasn't any loss of consciousness. So this is gonna be your classic kid that's coming in. This looks a little gaping to me, so maybe not the best idea to glue it. But the other things we need to think about when we're doing something on this kind of kid is foreign body, right? He was at the park, maybe it's a little dirty. So always kind of keeping the foreign body aspect in the back of your head. Um, if you were to do an x-ray, say it was on the hand or something, glass and metal are going to be radio-opaque. You could ultrasound for other foreign bodies, especially in like other extremities like the foot. Um, the key here is really exploring for those foreign bodies after we've given them some anesthesia. Okay, And that can be in the form of let. Um, it's totally appropriate to let that sit, and then we're going to go in and we're going to explore and we're going to irrigate. Um, if you have any concern for a fracture, that would be ideal to palpate you know, in the area around. So wound closure, um, for kids, mostly like simple facial lacs, the infection rate's really low. Um, the golden period, ideally, is to get them within six hours. Uh, if they're low-risk wound, wounds, you have about 12 to 24 hours to close them up. And with the face, you have up to 24 hours. Um, if they're really highly contaminated or immune compromised, when we're talking about an animal bite, we don't really want to suture them. But that's kind of just another topic. Um, which Sarah talked about great, and I'm going to probably use some of the same articles that she did, um, is wound irrigation. So again, this is another thing where you want them to be numbed out because it can be uncomfortable. So let that topical numbing work. Um, you can do saline, you can do sterile water, and now we know you can do tap water. Um, this is the time when you just want to explain to the child what they're going to expect. It's going to be cold, it's going to be wet. Um, something equating to like a bath, but a small bath, okay? Um, if it's an extremity, yeah, you can definitely have them stick it under running water, explain to them it's like washing your hands. Um, if it's on their head, you wanna make sure you're not dripping water in their face, um, but then at the same time, you know, what Sarah brought up is, do we even have to irrigate the face or the scalp wounds? And the answer is actually no. Um, you really don't have to. Uh, they looked at a, an article in 1998 and they had like 1,900 patients in this group. Um, 1,000 were saline irrigated and 830 didn't have any irrigation. The bottom line was uh, before the primary closure, there was no altered rate in the infection and or the cosmetic appearance, um, whether you irrigated or not. So on these forehead lacs, unless you see like dirt and crud sticking in the wound, you really don't have to go too crazy in terms of irrigating. A lot of times if you're doing a lack with me, I'll use a little bit of gauze, we'll use a little bit of tap water in a basin, and we'll kind of just talk about it and clean it at the same time. But I'm usually not reaching for a giant syringe to go flushing, you know, a liter of water into this kid's head. 
Um, same thing goes when I do want to irrigate it, same thing in your tap water. Bottom line here is you, they have almost the no clinically important differences in infection rate. So in the saline group, 2.8%, in the tap water group, 2.9%, big deal, right? So um, you can totally use tap water, right? Just make sure it's at a comfortable temperature. So when we're doing a lac repair, this is the time to really, you now you have 40 minutes, right? So you put some lead on this kid's face. You have 40 minutes to kind of get the family and the child prepared. This is the time where you want to eliminate questions and concerns and you want to help alleviate those fears, okay? So sit down, tell them we're going to use sutures, whether they're going to be absorbable or not, if you're going to use glue or staples. Um, you have to also be very confident when you're talking about this. This is not the time for you to go in and be like, oh, I don't know, maybe we're going to do this. They want to know exactly what you're going to do. They want to be confident that you know what you're doing, okay? Because you're the one who's going to be repairing their kid's face, all right? So, you know, if you have a question or a doubt, this is the time to say, like, oh, my senior's going to be with us or attending. But this is really your chance to kind of build their, their trust and their confidence. Um, kind of anticipating how this child is going to be, and I ask parents all the time, like, how is your kid normally with stuff? Do they get really anxious? Are they rambunctious? And they'd be like, oh no, he's usually pretty chill. He'll watch a video, he'll play a game. That's great, feed into that. Um, we don't have child life here, so we have to become child life, okay? That's making sure mom and dad's cell phone is charged so that they can watch that video, okay? That's helping to arrange stickers, distractions, things like that, okay? Um, I tend to let the parents stay in the room unless mom or dad gets like super nauseous for procedures and they're going to pass out. Let them stay in the room. They're the one that's going to provide the most comfort to the child. Um, and also kind of in the process of this, if you feel like the kid is getting more anxious or whatnot, that's when you might want to think of something, maybe intranasal or if you're going to have to go towards a full sedation. Um, this is a great slide because I think, you know, when you guys are on the adult side doing your procedures, you're like, Let's go, let's rock and roll, I'm drawing up my light cane. This is not the time to pull up that 18 gauge and you know, oh yeah, I'm gonna squirt light. This is not the time for that, okay? And I've seen it happen, and you have this chill, calm kid, and all of a sudden the resident comes out and they're like, oh, he's flipping out right now. And I'm like, what happened? I'm just drawing up the light cane. Yeah. So this is the time to do all of that out of the room, away from the kid, behind the curtain. I don't care what you have to do. But if you're going to have lidocaine at the ready, or you're going to use it, this is when you're drawing it up out of their sight. Okay? Same thing goes for the suture kit. They don't need to see you checking every suture every four steps. Okay? Get your kit ready, get it all laid out, because once you hit the ground running, we don't want to have interruptions. Okay? We want to get this done quickly. Um, a big key is not letting them see the needle. All right? Um, I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but I explain, especially when we're using absorbables, so let's be honest, we're doing that a lot, right? So I explain to the parents that these are what are called magic strings, okay? Kids understand magic, something mysterious. These strings are going to dissolve, okay? They're not going to stay in your body. They're going to go in, and I tell them what to expect, especially if it's on the face, and this is an older kid that can kind of understand what's going on. Tell them, these strings are going to be flying in front of your face. They may tickle your nose. They may even touch your eyelashes. Like, so those are things that we all see happen and the kid goes and swats at you because they didn't know it was going to happen. So if you forewarn them, and I just had one recently, I think I was with Bobak. If you tell them what they're going to expect, they're like, oh yeah, that's tickling my nose. Or, oh yeah, that's my eyelash. Like, they're a lot more calm, they know what's going on. Um, I do show them the strings, but I, I carefully mount the needle and it's in my hand with the forceps, okay? I show them what the forceps looks like. If I'm using magic strings, I have to have a magic wand, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work, okay? So my forceps are my magic wand. Strings are my magic strings. I show them the scissors. These are to cut the magic strings, okay? This is not to cut your face. This is not to cut your hair. They will not touch you, right? All these things, because then you're going to go cut that suture after you just placed it, and they're going to freak out because they see the scissors coming at them, right? So I know these sound silly, but trust me, once you start using them, it makes it a lot more... Uh, a lot more tolerable. <laughs> um, the other thing is immobilizing them, right? So this is where the parents are really going to come in handy. You should be in charge or have someone help you be in charge of the area that you're suturing. The rest of the body is the parent's domain, okay? If they want to hug the child, if they want to lay with the child, I'm totally okay with that, okay? Um, because let's be honest, it's going to be more comforting for the child to have the parent holding their hand than the nurse holding them down, okay? <coughs> 
basic things that we're all used to. You've all done a lack of pairs, so you know what's included in here. Um, other things to think about is the papoose. This is not as barbaric as some make it seem. You know, if you get a kid that's like calm and old enough, and even a little baby that makes you think the parent, she's awfully happy to get me. <laughs> um, if you have a parent that feels like they're not going to be able to hold a kid, or maybe he's going to kick, this is fine to kind of like say, we're going to give you a big hug, okay? You're going to feel nice and secure. Mom's going to lay with you, right? This is not to say like we're papoosing the kid and kicking mom and dad out. That's not going to work, okay? <coughs> So this is the time to kind of think about using this. We have it in room seven, it's hiding behind the door. Use it if you need to, okay? My other favorite thing is draping or not draping. Um, I personally know that I have, if I had to have something sutured on my face, I don't think I'd want my eyes to be covered. It would, you know, you've noticed this when you do a central line, right? You're like, hey, are you still okay down there? Like, it's, it's a little disconcerting to be covered, okay? So I would say use your judgment. This is more of a personal preference thing. Um, if this kid has wild hair and you're, you know, the suture is going to be going in and out of the hair, then what I tend to do is actually not this, is I kind of raise it up a little and I make it almost like a little hat. And I, I've been known to like put a piece of tape and just kind of tape it over the hair because in honesty, a lot of see that's what's going to get in your way, is your suture is kind of dragging through the hair. I also find it's a good little spot to keep the top of the bed sterile. I can put my suture, you know, uh, I can put my suture there, I can put my scissors there if I need to. Um, and it also just doesn't make the anxiety form. Um, what else? What else? Here's my magic strings, right? If I'm going to use magic strings, I'm using a magic wand. Try it and let me know if it helps. But I've had pretty good success with it, okay? So the key with this laceration repair is being quick, right? So once you decide what you're going to do, move along, irrigate your wound, and start your repair. But at the same time, talk through it, use some distractions, try not to dilly-dally. This is the time you just want to get it done. Okay? Questions on that? No? Um, so next up, farm body removal, something we see a lot of. Um, and something you should try and get really good at because um, if you're going to be out practicing and managing peds in another hospital that maybe doesn't have, you know, a lot of ped subspecialties, you got to know how to get these farm bodies out, otherwise you might have to transfer them. We don't want that. So, um, the key is, it's usually the ears and the nose for the most part. A lot of times the parents will come in and they know exactly what it is. Oh yeah, he's playing with a bead and then all of a sudden the bead is gone. If they don't know what it is, try and get some type of idea, whether it's something you can see and you're looking at it, but that can help guide how you're going to take it out, okay? So something like a bead, uh, oh actually we'll, we'll go through, we'll go through the nose removal uh, using the Foley, using the forceps, and using the kissing technique. And then for the ears, we're going to do forceps, flushing, and suction. So if you've ever had to remove a bead, they're actually, it's nice to use the alligator forceps, but they actually don't always get a good grip on them because they have rounded edges and they can be really, really tricky. So getting an idea of what it is that you're going for is going to help reduce your amount of attempts to try and get this out. Um, soft objects, such as like food or maybe it was like a little piece of a sponge or something like that, just keep in mind that they can swell if you decide to flush them. It's not to say you can't do it, it's just to say keep an eye out if, you know, this is something that you think may, may obstruct even more once you add water, okay? And then the other thing is always check all the holes. Both nostrils, both ears. Even if they come in with just a nose, far body, check the ears. Okay, because if they're putting things in one hole, they're going to try to put the other. All right. Cool. So forceps extraction, um, this is pretty popular for the nose. It works pretty well if it's something that's kind of soft, something that you can grab, a piece of paper. Um, ideally, just have the kid be comfortable. If this means sitting in mom's lap and she's hugging him, that's fine. Get really good lighting. Uh, you can use a headlamp if you want. You could use the overhead light. Um, just be really careful here because once you go in, you kind of want to grab that far body and get it out. There should be no digging. This is a very vascular area in the nose, so once it starts bleeding, it's going to obscure what you need to see, okay? So if you don't have a good, like, aim for it or you can't see it well, then I wouldn't go poking and prodding. Um, for the most part, you can use the alligator forceps plus minus a needle speculum. I've had pretty good luck with that, um, just kind of helping to open things up. Older kids tolerate it okay, and you're able to kind of really move the tissue out of the way and go and get it. All right? Um, this is the other technique. How many of you have used this kissing technique? Yeah, yeah it's kind of cool, right? Some people don't know about it, but if you know it, you're, you're going to be good to go. Um, the parent has to be willing, okay? 
Um, ideally, the parent's going to blow into the kid's mouth pretty hard, and at the same time, they're going to occlude the nostril that doesn't have the foreign body in it. If, usually, within a couple of good blows, the object comes out, but this can be very snotty. It can be very wet. Um, I've had kids like vomit after it. Like, it's a lot. <laughs> so, just be prepared, have some chucks, make sure you're wearing gloves, okay? Um, and have the kid like pretty comfortable. If there's two parents involved, great, maybe one can sit and hold the kid and the other can blow. Um, the other variation that I saw is actually using the Ambu bag, which I'm gonna show you because I had never seen it. And uh, I was talking to a friend about it, and she's like, oh, it's a waste of an Ambu bag, but I thought it was a great idea. So this little kid has a nasal farm body. It's gonna show you really quick and then it's gonna do a slow mo. Sideways and the pipe seal so you turn it sideways, you're not covering the nose. Someone's holding the kid down. You will also note that the provider is including the child's left nostril so that all the pressure is forced through the right nostril. <laughs> <laughs> and usually this is... <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> so, you know, next time you have a parent that's like, I'm not giving my kid a kiss on the mouth like that, um, you can totally, you can totally uh, have them try that. I mean, hey, it's, it's an ambu bag, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, give it a try. I think it's pretty neat. Um, okay, so now say you've tried all that, you can't get it out. I've actually had this work quite nicely. You find the tiniest Foley catheter that you can, check the balloon, fill it up, deflate it. This is really if you can see the object and you think you may be able to pass something behind it. Uh, I, this worked really well for a bead that I had recently that I could just not get a grasp on. Um, and the dad tried the blowing technique like a couple times, we had no luck, so then we decided to do the Foley and it worked fantastic. So you basically slip it behind